Uh, thank you for inviting me. There is a, a brochure that we produced uh, called uh, Picasso, Chomsky and Their Friends, and as part of the tradition of the Sydney Peace Foundation, it's free. Um, that's an incentive to, for you to join the Sydney Peace Foundation, but there's only a limited number of copies which, will, if you want them, we'll give them out afterwards. I was first asked to come to speak at Art After Hours on uh, a topic called Challenges for Peace in the 21st Century. And after the first paragraph of Scribble, it seemed to me that was a bit dour, as the Scots say. And uh, as, as a way to begin the ending of the Picasso exhibition, um, it occurred to me that after we had just awarded the Sydney Peace Prize to Noam Chomsky, that it would be more valuable to look at uh, the common ground between Chomsky and Picasso and to argue that they were both enormous inspirations for peace. Picasso, I don't need to say anything about. Chomsky, <coughs> for, is that on? Yep. Uh, Chomsky is regarded as the, as the uh, most widely read, most widely known intellectual in the Western world. If you look at the if you look at the Guinness Book of Records, they list the six most quoted people, five of whom are dead, uh, and the sixth is, is Noam Chomsky. They were both generous with their time to other people, for other people. They were both anarchists, if by their anarchism we understand enormous respect for the interdependence of people and possessions, the encouragement of spontaneity of expression and a constant distrust and questioning of authority. They both supported major causes for justice. In the case of Picasso, he was a lifelong campaigner against apartheid. <clears throat> In the case of uh, Chomsky, he's been a lifelong campaigner for justice for the people of Palestine. They both had friends who were enormously inspiring. And because this talk is called Chomsky, Picasso, and their friends, I'm going to refer to Paul Robeson and Paul Eluard and uh, Pablo Neruda in the case of Picasso, and to A.J. Musty and Lord Bertrand Russell in the case of, of Chomsky. There's a poem written by a wonderful American pacifist poet called William Stafford, and it captures the essence of the thoughts and ideas of both Picasso and Chomsky. And given that what I want to talk about really is a way of thinking inspired by great art and great, great literature, great writing, the, the lines from the, from the uh, Stafford poem are appropriate. He wrote, sometimes commanders try to take us over and they want to impose their whole universe how to succeed by daily calculation. I can't eat that bread. And by bread he meant, the bread he was referring to was the preoccupation with control, the preoccupation with building hierarchies, the preoccupation with different forms of discipline and punishment of people who ever got out of line. And of course the corollary of that poem is about the, the, the assumption that militarism and violence was the way to solve any problem. So a complete rejection of that. Now I want to say something because uh, Andrew Yip of the Art Gallery asked me to, say, to, to explain why we awarded the Peace Prize to Chomsky. Because in many ways the philosophy and practice of the Peace Foundation over the past 15 years in choosing giants of the 20th and 21st century to come to this country reflects the contents of that Stafford poem. The, the jury uses three criteria to choose the recipients. The first is a commitment to global peace with justice. In other words, you can't be entirely local. The second is a commitment to evidence of a commitment to universal human rights. And the third is evidence of living by the language and philosophy and practice of nonviolence. And Chomsky, as, as uh, Susie, who introduced me, mentioned, has really been imitating all the other significant giants who won the Sydney Peace Prize. And if Picasso had been alive, we would surely would have nominated him, and the jury would surely have chosen him. 
I want to now look at, as it were, two particular uh, concepts that um, convey the common ground between, uh, between Chomsky and Picasso. The first concept is the personal is the political, and the second concept is about a commitment to universal human rights. That first concept, I understand, was a creation of, um, of uh, feminists about 50 years ago, and it really refers to the notion that we're fooling ourselves if we think we can make a distinction between the conduct of our personal lives and our attitude to politics. That doesn't mean the politics of party affiliation necessarily. It will usually mean a, the politics with reference to the way you use authority and the way you uh, respond to authority. It's quite apparent that um, although he never wrote about or painted about the personals that is the political, that um, Picasso was very concerned never to make that distinction. If you look at the painting of Guernica and the protest against war, you'll see that fusion between the personal and political. He was preoccupied throughout his life with the um, behavior of German and Italian fascists towards his own country and elsewhere across Europe. He painted, and these three paintings I'm going to mention are all in the exhibition here. The Charnel House, which was about the massacre of Spaniards in their own homes during the Civil War. He painted a wonderful painting, which is also here, uh, Spaniards who died for France, and then the Korean massacre. Each of them protests about the absurdity and violence of war. In similar vein, um, Chomsky also lived the notion of that the personal is the political. He thought it was absurd to make a distinction between theory and practice. And if there are any university people in the audience, he resisted any notion that um, you should make a distinction between uh, being an academic and being an activist. In fact, I, I, hope, I like to think that throughout my career in Sydney University and elsewhere, I, I, I claimed and uh, encouraged others to believe that they should spend 51% of their time on the streets and only 49% in the ivory tower. That way they might be able to claim a bit of uh, credibility. So, so much for the personal is the political. That second concept is about the commitment to universal human rights. Picasso once said that he tried to put as much of humanity as possible into all of his paintings. He, uh, after the Second World War, was implored to, uh, pr to uh, pr pursue and to um, campaign on behalf of all sorts of uh, issues, support for Hungarian refugees, support for, for Jewish refugees, support for the Rosenbergs about to be sentenced to death in America for uh, allegedly passing on atomic secrets to the Russians, uh, campaign for, for penal reform, campaigned against the death penalty. So there's enormous evidence that, uh, that uh, universal human rights was, was, close to, uh, was close to Picasso's heart. At every Congress after the war, and the immediate post-war years were littered with peace congresses, he um, was the, either the invited speaker or invited to sit in the audience as, as you are today. In 1956, when he was um, invited to design a poster for the Congress of African Artists and Writers, he wrote an inscription below it that captures the spirit and values of the man. He said, uh, I crave for universal thirst and for universal hunger to, to eventually be free so that they may, in their closed intimacy, enjoy the succulence of those fruits. A huge commitment to um, freedom for the people of Africa, and at, and at that time, of course, commitment to decolonization. In the 1949 Peace Congress in Paris, he had been asked to design the, the famous poster which has become the symbol for peace around the world, the dove. And uh, 
his partner at the time, I can never remember whether she was a partner or mistress or what, but her, her name was Francois Gillot, gave birth to a baby whom I often mistakenly refer to as Pavlova, but in fact it's Paloma, which in Spanish means the dove. So, uh, and I've just come back from two weeks on the West Bank and in the Gaza Strip, and uh, the, gre the, one, the most impressive graffiti in many parts of the West Bank and in Gaza is Picasso is the, is the dove, except that there, at, at the heart of the dove, is fixed uh, the target for a gun, which um, in a way brings us up to date with the notion that violence uh, may solve some problems in the views of some politicians. Uh, when we switch from Picasso to, to Chomsky, it's quite apparent again that in all of his writings, in particular his challenge to the absurd power of the American military and the absurd number of wars that they have fought in defense of uh, corporate America and their allies, including Australia, um, that uh, he is a great champion of human rights. The fact that the American media spends a fortune trying to ensure that Chomsky's values and ideas do not reach the American public shows how influential he is. We could have filled the, the Sydney Opera House ten times over if we'd repeated the Sydney Peace Prize lecture this year. Some of my colleagues say that if we could solve the financial problems of the Sydney Peace Foundation if we awarded the Peace Prize to Noam Chomsky every year. Um, at that point I forgot what I was going to say next, but um, Chomsky, when I was, uh, uh, when we went to, to London to make an award to Julian Assange, not the Peace Prize Award, we went out of our way to do this because he had challenged the notion that governments should re remain secret in much of their conduct. I met with Chomsky in Boston on the way to London and he, had sent, he asked me to send a message to Julian Assange and this, the content of this message conveys why Noam Chomsky is such a great champion of freedom of expression and human rights. He said, I congratulate you on being a member of, of taking seriously your responsibility as a member of free societies whose citizens have every right to know what their government is doing. End quote. End of, end of message. You may want to ask me later why we uh, awarded a gold medal to Julian Assange, but, uh, and I'm happy to talk about that. Let's switch in the final 10 minutes to Chomsky and, um, uh, and Picasso's great friends, because no man is an island, and the interdependence of Picasso with his, the people who inspired him, and he inspired them, and, and the same as Chomsky, is, uh, is significant. The French, well, the, the first, the great friend of uh, Picasso was Paul Robeson, the wonderful Negro spiritual singer, as he was called at that time. He'd be called Afro-American now. And uh, Robeson was frequently denied access to those peace congresses, in particular in Britain in 1949 in Sheffield, when the British government was so intimidated by McCarthyism in America that they refused of refused to allow Paul Robeson and the Russian composer Dmitry Shostakovich to, to appear at the, um, at the Congress, and Picasso protested. Robeson wrote to Picasso, we are people of all colors and conditions, we are united in our pursuit of peace. And the beautiful uh, Australian dimension, or Sydney dimension, of the magnificent Paul Robeson is of course that he was the first performer at the, at the Sydney Opera House. He appeared on the construction site to sing to the workers. He sang Old Man River. He sang I Thought I Heard um, um, Joe Hill Last Night. Uh, there's a one, if you can Google it, you can, there are all sorts of three minute uh, repeats of the magnificent Paul Robson, champion of human rights, singing to the construction workers on the Sydney, on the site of the slowly growing Sydney Opera House. Wonderful uh, reminder for, uh, for Sydney. Um, if only we could continue to emulate um, Robeson. Pablo Neruda, of course, who was the wonderful Chilean poet in exile, 
wrote voluminously against war and against violence. He protested war at, at, uh, and the absurdity of violence uh, at every stage of his life. Paul Eluard, who was known as the French resistance poet, protested about the Nazi occupation of France in a poem called uh, 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 Dusk Devours uh, the Monsters. In other words, dusk. when dusk comes, uh, there's a chance, so I got that wrong, it should be dawn. When dawn comes, there's a possibility that optimism will, will occur. And he wrote that um, they, he, by that he meant not just the Nazis, but even the bullies and bureaucracies, and the dictators and the leaders who think that war, including Bush, Blair, Howard, Obama, and so on, is a, think that's a way to carry on. He wrote, they gnawed away the smiles and flowers. They found a heart only at the end of their rifles. Now, as with so many poets, they often capture in a few words what it, <laughs> in, other, in, in books it takes volumes, it, volumes to speak about. Let me switch quickly to the friends of uh, Chomsky, and two in particular. One a gentleman, a philosopher, a revolutionary pacifist called A.J. Musty, whom Chomsky regards as the greatest, or one of the greatest thinkers and writers and philosophers in America. Probably don't knew, know too much about him. But um, Musty was concerned with violence, he thought, we should try to disassociate ourselves with what he called 90% of the problem. And it, it, what he said has as much relevance to February the 8th, 2012, as it had to when he was writing in protest about the, um, about the carnage of the First World War and the preparation for the Second. And subsequently, the, the, uh, the um, absurd loss of life in the Vietnam War. What he meant was that um, we collude too easily with the notion that we need large defense budgets to protect us. At a time when the last time I did a survey, luckily for in, in Australia, about what security really meant to Australians, contrary to those who were asking for a larger defense budget in Canberra, wanting more obsolete tanks, helicopters that don't fly, and submarines that are so noisy you can't use them. Uh, the Australian public said by a mile in this large survey that universal health insurance gave them the greatest sense of security. Nothing to do with, and that was, that it seemed to me was pretty consistent with A.J. Musty's uh, stance and values. And the final, the final uh, friend was Bertrand Russell, great logician, mathematician, philosopher, found one of the co-founders of the, of the campaign for nuclear disarmament and of the Committee of 100. He was, if you listen to the range of campaigns he was involved in, he was for universal suffrage, for penal reform, against the death penalty, for reproductive rights, for sexual freedom, for freedom of thought, it goes on and on and on. He, uh, he was also concerned about the way humor could um, transcend bullies and dictators and could, you could, how you could use satire to, as it were, show that the emperor has no clothes. He concluded after the First World War, I remember, that wars don't decide who's right, they only decide who's left. And Chomsky, in his, in his uh, office at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Boston, has a large cutout of Bertrand Russell, his hero, it's a bit unusual for somebody as, as genius as Chomsky to acknowledge having such a hero. But there he is. And the three precepts that governed Bertrand Russell's life uh, are written there. The first is a longing for love. The second was a search for knowledge. And the third is unbearable pity for the suffering of mankind. Well, let me draw the, world, the, 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 the talk full circle at this point and just mention again why I'm arguing about the common ground between Picasso and Chomsky. They both challenged convention. They were both for freedom of thought and resisted anybody who tried to control them. 
Picasso was a communist, lifelong communist, but when the Russians tried to insist on conformity in uh, art and thought and music, he wrote back to them, I don't tell you how to do economics, you have no right to tell me how to paint. So that's common, common re resistance to and challenging of um, authority. They were what I call intellectually promiscuous. The word promiscuous always makes students uh, sit up and start to take notice because they're never quite sure what's going to come next. Uh, we don't need to know too much about Picasso to know that he was painter, sculptor, stage designer, uh, painter, uh, drawer, cer ceramicist, potter. In other words, he crossed every discipline boundary that he could think of. Chomsky also was mathematician, computer scientist, uh, linguist, political scientist. In fact, when Niels Yerner, the, um, the Dane who recently received the Nobel Prize for Medicine for immunology, he acknowledged the value of uh, Chomsky's work on narrative grammar to help him to understand the scope of the immune system. So there are, those, there are the common grounds which really are conveying to us encouragement about different ways to think, different ways to conduct relationships, different ways to think that we have an op we don't have to be a great artist or a great writer to, to uh, make a difference. And, that, uh, and the difference is about protesting our disbelief that um, militarism and uh, the search for scapegoats at the present, foreign policy, it looks as though we want to make China the scapegoat for the next 50 years. So we're going to place Marines in the north of, uh, uh, <laughs> north of Australia to make us more, quote, secure, unquote. We have to get rid of that way of thinking. We have to realize that it's a hundred times more interesting to study peace with justice than it is to promote the pursuit of war. Uh, when I was discussing this topic with Noam Chomsky, he said, well, the trouble is you're only talking about allegedly great people. What happens to uh, uh, ordinary citizens who may feel that they uh, can't make such a great difference? And um, I, I, I want to finish by resisting that notions, notion that none of you can make a difference. You can make an enormous difference by joining the Sydney Peace Foundation for a start. There is in a Sydney park an inscription carved in rock to one of our great friends, Dr. Stella Cornelius, who was a founder of the Conflict Resolution Network in this country and who was a founder member of the Sydney Peace Foundation. And carved in the rock of that park, it says, wise owls think of peace, wise people make it happen. Thank you. My question's about Julian Assange and oh, sorry. Why, why, did, why, why did the Sydney Peace Foundation award the, the medal to Assange? Okay. Okay, yeah, well, some people have blinked at that. Um, this was at a time when, uh, well, I mean, there's several reasons. First of all, we've put up with centuries of being encouraged to think that governments should remain, that their conduct should remain secret. We're multiplying like mad the number of ASIO operatives in this country at the moment. We continue to pass laws that erode your civil liberties under the guise of security. So historically we regarded the revelations by WikiLeaks as important. Even if they had only released via Assange and WikiLeaks, the video clip called Collateral Damage, which showed the murder of 11 ba Baghdad citizens including a couple of children in the streets of Baghdad from a US Apache helicopter. And the, the people murdered included two Reuters photographers. And Reuters, a very powerful media organization, had tried for nearly three years under freedom of information to discover what had happened to their employees. Even if Assange and co. had only released that, it would have been worthy. What happened was that the Australian government, I think under instructions from Washington, decided that although Assange was an Australian citizen, he wouldn't, the Attorney General said he wouldn't be welcome in this country. Uh, the Prime Minister said he'd committed an offence when he'd committed no offence. So we decided that enough was enough. We would make a protest against the cowardice of the Australian government, against their compliance 
with the Pentagon and we would fly to London and make that, a, that, that award. He'd been convicted of nothing. He'd made historically an important gesture. That was why. Thanks. Uh, other than joining the Peace Foundation, it was, uh, it's good to, to know that you believe that we can make a difference, but just maybe share some of your thoughts on how we can make that difference <coughs> in our everyday life. Sure, okay. I mean, there are plenty of people in the audience who can answer that question as, uh, as, as well as me, but I'm not gonna duck it, it's okay. Look, uh, one of the greatest, perhaps the greatest document of the 20th century is called the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And um, there are 30 clauses. They're about rights and responsibilities. The, the right wing in Australia and elsewhere usually likes to argue that we need a charter of responsibilities as well. That's very naughty, because if you read the clauses carefully, you'll see that responsibilities are built in. And each clause really is about uh, a responsibility to one another in every context. It might be in the home, it might be in the school or university or the workplace. It might be in something as rarefied as international relations. So the way we treat one another, in particular the way we treat vulnerable people, might be the unemployed. It might be deciding that uh, the treatment of the Palestinians has gone on for 64 years too long. And it's about time we challenge the people in Canberra to stop being cowards and do something about it. It might be something as ambitious as that, but it might be about Tibet, and it might be about Sri Lanka, uh, uh, or it might be about uh, the assumption that abusive uses of power are okay. There has to be an end to that. And there, there's almost an opportunity, I think, almost every day to pick up on that sort of issue. Did you find any cause for optimism in your recent visit to Gaza? And um, a lot of artists have gone there. Are they having any uh, influence at all? A uh, lot of what, sorry? A lot of artists have been to the wall and sure. painted. Is, yeah. is that having any impact in the community there? Do, do people feel sure. involved? Sure. Well, um, the artists really provide a wonderful site for photographers. And there are plenty of photographers rushing up to look at Banksy's drawings on the wall and uh, uh, questions why does the United States fund this wall? Um, in fact, people in refugee camps said to me that the, the, U the United States is fighting against us more than Israel. Look, I didn't find, I, I've been there many times as a colleague of mine who's here has been there more times than me. I was more pessimistic. There's only one hope and this really re reverts back to your question, and that's the boycott, divestment, sanctions campaign against the government of Israel. It's, remember, it's not against the Israeli people, crucial distinction, but every, every leader, every politician, uh, said, even the most despairing of people, said the BDS was the only hope. There's huge, the, the, the encroachment by the settlements is 10 times worse than I've ever seen it. I mean, it's basic, the, the, um, the, the, I'll give you the contrast. In Hebron, we were spat on by, by settlers. That's a divided, it's an Arab city, but it's divided, taken over by 500 settlers, guarded by up to, at different times, 10,000 troops. When we went to Gaza, I found people generous, courteous, pleading with us that they merely wanted the chance to prove that they are human beings. So um, if, if America, supported by Australia, continues to behave in a state of ignorance, I'll put it as gently as possible, there isn't much hope. If, the civil, if civil societies around the world realize that the hope is in the BDS campaign, um, which was not dissimilar to what happened to bringing down apartheid in South Africa, then there's, then there's one hope. I mean, my philosophy is that justice for the Palestinians equals security for Israel. <laughs> that's, that's the formula as far as I'm concerned. But I thought there was a great deal more pessimism now, a uh, great deal more arrogance, a uh, great deal more missiles, a great deal more 
uh, uh, military checkpoints and so on than there was last time I was there. Hi, um, I just wanted to ask you about the recent freedom flotillas uh, to Gaza, you know, that were unsuccessful. Sure. Um, what do you think they achieved? Well, I think um, one of the real problems of the Palestinian uh, question since 1948 has been ignorance about what really went on around the world. The Palestinians referred to 1948 as the Nakba, the catastrophe. It was a catastrophe. Almost overnight, 512 towns and villages belonging to the Arabs were, were erased off the face of the earth. H hundreds of thousands, now millions of people became refugees. Um, so the value of the flotilla is, is, a, is a form of waking up to the conscience and consciousness of people around the world. We, uh, I mean, one of the great contributions of Chomsky is in a book called The Manufacture of Consent. And what he shows is how the media gives only a small, narrow version of reality. Very small, very narrow, very opinionated, coming largely from one source. And so, uh, in a way, the flotilla, even though they've never reached there, um, is an enormous contribution into raising, multiplying public awareness in the same way, sadly, in which the so-called Gaza War, which wasn't a war at all, it was just organized uh, massacre. I mean, the killing ratio was 100 to 1. That wasn't a war, and yet the media calls it a war in the same way that the Gaza war began to raise the consciousness even of people who knew nothing or were disinterested into saying, you know, this is a cancer. I mean, I often say, maybe I better finish with this kind of macabre analogy. If I was a, a, a cancer physician and you came to me with secondary growths, I wouldn't be interested. I want to know where the primary site was. And in international relations, the primary site of the cancers that are going around the world is the failure to settle the Israeli-Palestinian dispute. 